Welcome to Do You Ever Wonder? The show that brings you answers to many of the questions that you may have, but with no one to ask. Do You Ever Wonder is hosted by Mike Haltman, CEO of Hallmark Abstract Service, who, like you, has always been deeply curious about a wide variety of topics. Each week, Mike will be speaking with guests who are leaders in their field and who have inspirational stories to tell. So now, sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. Today we are uh, very lucky, I mean, with the, for anyone who watches the news, and even if you don't watch the news, we have, uh, we have many issues going on around the world. Uh, some people opine that the world is on fire, and if uh, hopefully that's not the case, and hopefully today's guest, Doctor, do you, do you go by Dr. Stephen? Which, whichever you prefer. I, I got a lot of titles, so you can use whichever ones you prefer. All right. Well, you know what? My son is going for a PhD, so I'm hoping people would call him Doc. That, so that's okay. All right, Doc. What's up? Uh, <laughs> actually, so, you know, full disclosure, I used to uh, write a blog, and it was actually a political blog, and I used to opine very deeply on, uh, on issues that I saw and my opinions about those issues, but uh, I stopped doing that because I didn't think it was necessarily good for my business but uh you know having the opportunity to have you on and, and let me just go over some of your credentials so uh dr stephen bucci bucci correct yes bucci just like gucci only with a b all right but and you're less expensive a but, lot less yeah <laughs> so uh dr stephen was in the uh special Special Forces Army for 28 years. He is a cybersecurity expert. Uh, he was in the private sector, IBM, U.S. Chamber of Commerce. He was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense with Donald Rumsfeld. And I know that's a hot button name that uh, some people love and some people don't love. And you were the military, also the military assistant to the Secretary of Defense. Correct. You are now a security consultant and you are a visiting fellow with the Heritage Foundation. Your credentials are impeccable, and uh, all I can say is welcome. It's a great pleasure and honor to have you here. Well, it's, it's my pleasure to be on the show as well, and I look forward to the conversation. Terrific. So if I might, I would say that you are fluent in national security, homeland security, cybersecurity, terrorism, and defense issues. Would you say that? That covers it, or am I giving you too much credit? No, I, I well, I, I won't say I am the expert in all those areas, but I am definitely conversant at all of them. Have spent a lot of time dealing with them from the the operator standpoint, as well as from the upper level government standpoint, and from the think tank world. So, uh, I I kid people if you hang around long enough in life, you get that have a lot of jobs and it gives you a really long resume now absolutely but you know what you have a uh, you have a long resume but you have a very good resume so uh i i saw some breaking news this morning which wasn't really breaking news that our secretary of defense was in icu uh for for days that nobody knew it his uh, second in command didn't know it the white house didn't know it what um what does that say? And again, I'm trying to come from this from a bipartisan, apolitical bent. But when you, given the issues in the world, when your uh, Secretary of Defense is incapacitated and no one knows, what what is that saying, just in, in general terms? I, I got to tell you, having worked directly for the Secretary of Defense for nearly six years, uh, actually a tad more than six years, uh, and had essentially daily contact with them, except for the six months I went off on a sabbatical to Iraq for to do some other stuff. Uh, I have to tell you, this is out of whack. Uh, the the idea that the sec def goes in the hospital, uh, even if you know, I, Secretary Rumsfeld was like really uh, obsessive about his privacy. He was a very private person. You know, obviously a big political figure, but his in you know his his inside life he thought was his, but he understood 
you know, if he went for a routine medical procedure that required anesthesia, which, you know, guys at a certain age get those kind of things now and then, uh, you had to not just notify the deputy secretary of defense, the, the joint chiefs, the chairman, the White House, all those players that they were going to have to operate without the secretary for those couple of hours. You you had to do that. It wasn't an option. You know, you couldn't hide it. And then to have, you know, seemingly, I'm assuming it started with something like that, because we still don't know the, the medical reason that the secretary was in the hospital. Uh, but if something goes wrong, something gets nicked, something like that, and suddenly the sec def is in the ICU for multiple days before anybody other than apparently his personal office knew about it, that's somebody dropped the ball there or somebody was trying to pull a fast one. I don't know why. I mean, this, this stuff happens. It's not like it's a crime for the, the sec def to go to the hospital, but you got to tell everybody in the chain of command above you and below you that it's happening. And well, the, for the deputy secretary to not find out until the fourth day, and then when she's still in Puerto Rico on vacation, that's whack. Uh, somebody needs to, you know, this is one I'm not real big on, you know, saying Congress needs to have hearings every time somebody hiccups. But right. this is one that there should be some hearings on because this is a major process foul in our national security system. And uh, somebody needs to be called to task for it. Now. One of the big words that I always hear on TV uh, or even in the press or wherever is is who's going to be held accountable. And I find accountability, the word accountability is a bunch of crap because no one really is ever held accountable. But, you know, him resigning, uh, you know, is is what he did a resignable offense. But more than that, what does it tell us about the the chain of command, the 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 way that our national security is being handled. Is it, that's troubling. Uh, it, it is troubling. And whether or not he should resign over it, I mean, we need to look into it to see who made this decision. Did the secretary go in thinking it was just going to be, you know, a two hour thing. And they said, oh, you know, maybe we don't need to tell anybody about this. That's still a mistake. That was wrong. But if, it, if it's that level and then you know, he got nicked or something. He was under anesthetic and his staff decided not to tell anybody. Then somebody on the staff needs to get fired who made that call. Uh, right. So it, it depends who actually made the call. Did the secretary do this because he was embarrassed about what he was doing? I had a, a radio call this morning and somebody said, well, maybe he was transitioning. I'm going, come on, let's not go there, please. Uh, but it's, you know, if if it's something that they did this with intent to to defraud everybody or to hide what was going on. OK, then maybe the secretary should be resigning. So we need to look into it a little more. But to your point, somebody needs to be held accountable. Somebody made a decision to do this, whether it was Secretary Austin or a staff member after he was, you know, under care and, and uh, you know, not compass mentis, as they say. Uh, then it's it's somebody else's ball. But I got to tell you, this is not the way you do it. The, you know, there's never supposed to be no one in charge of the Department of Defense. Okay. And, and, and it's not done by, oh, yeah, well, we'll call them if we need them. I mean, this needs to be set in stone. Everybody needs to know who is going to be the big person at the table should some crisis arise. It's very intentional, very set process. And they blew it out of the water on this one. And, and it's just, it's wrong. It put America at risk. Thank goodness nothing happened uh, during that time. But that doesn't mean because nothing happened, it should just be brushed under the table. Somebody failed and broke the process and they, they need to be held accountable. We just don't know exactly who it is yet. It is curious because to reach the rank of general, you probably have become accustomed to following process and have become religious about the process. So it is curious why somebody in that role and at that rank would just ignore the process. But 
you know, it, it's happened before. You know, I, I recall when the Secretary of Transportation disappeared for two months and nobody knew. So, I mean, maybe it's uh, unique to this administration. And again, I want to be apolitical about it, but some of these issues that are national security in nature are troubling, no question about it. So to follow that up, and I hate this phrase as well, besides accountability, but of all the issues going on in the world right now, domestically and foreign, is there one specific issue that keeps you up at night? Well, right now, I mean, for a while it was Ukraine, you know, the fight in Ukraine, because, you know, nobody wants to see that widen out and become a full up war between Russia and the West. Uh, but, you know, that one, it, it's kind of bogged down. Uh, that's not necessarily good for Ukraine, but it's it doesn't augur for Putin suddenly breaking out and attacking Poland or something like that, as was a possibility earlier on. But right. now the one that's bothering me is is clearly the Middle East. Uh, we got a lot of players there. Uh, you know, the Iranians don't play by the same rules as everybody else. Their goals are, you know, starting the, the Muslim apocalypse. Uh, and if somebody has that as a goal and one of the stair steps to that point is to destroy Israel or, or the United States, that's concerning. Then you throw into it the 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 wild cards of Hamas, Hezbollah, the Syrian government, the Houthis, these folks are, you know, they are way outside the norm of behavior of of non-governmental entities or or governmental entities. And one of them could try and pull something that's totally, you know, I won't say they're crazy, but they're definition of rational behavior is different than yours and mine. And there's no doubt about that. I'm not bad mouthing Muslims or anything else, but they, these groups are radical groups who don't care about who they kill or how they kill them. And that makes me very nervous. And what adds to that, Mike, and I'll, I'll give you a chance to jump oh, in. Yeah, that's great. Uh, it's uh, the, th the thing that concerns me on a tactical level is we have troops in that region that are being struck almost every day. Uh, right. In some cases, pinpricks, in some cases, you know, creating serious casualties. And our response right now just baffles me. To sit there and go, well, you know, every once in a while we'll hit a target just to let them know we don't like what they're doing, but we've decided not to engage them. How could you not engage the Houthis? They're trying to close down the Persian Gulf. They're, <laughs> they're shooting at, at civilian shipping. Uh, and, and the guys, you know, the, the um, militias out of Iraq and in Syria who are attacking our forces there, we should be deliberately targeting Every one of those militia groups that has shot at us with malice aforethought, we need to pick first the installations where we know there are Iranian advisors there from the IRGC Quds Force and hammer those facilities, not avoid them. Because, you know, I get I don't think we should carpet bomb Iran. We don't want to have a war with them either. But right now. We need to make them feel the pain because they're the one causing all his problems. And the easiest way to do that is to hit their proxies that have IRGC Cuds Force advisors at them and kill some of those people and not apologize about it, not, you know, clutch our pearls and swoon. We need to hammer those folks. And that's well short of war, uh, well short of, of deliberately expanding the crisis it is a legitimate response to the provocations that those various folks are doing right now. And this administration doesn't seem to have a taste to do that. Correct. Uh, so I, I pretty much agree with everything you've said. Uh, you know, it, it's always struck me over the years how people sit down at the table to negotiate with Iran. Uh, you cannot negotiate with terrorists. They will tell you whatever you want to hear and they will do whatever it is they want to do. We have American hostages in Gaza. Uh, you, you know, the, Israel is, is they're trying to, to hamstrung, hamstring, hamstring Israel in terms of their response. I mean, I'm an, I'm an American Jew. 
and you know the the hospital being bombed and everyone blaming israel was just a you know it was it was carte blanche to anti-semitism is now what whatever but i i agree a hundred percent that if somebody is bombing american soldiers it takes more for you know what i i don't understand other than the fact that it may maybe it's an election year maybe Maybe you don't want to upset your base, but that's not the way, that's not how commanders and commanders in chief should be viewing the, uh, the issues. You, you're there to protect America and American interests, and that ain't happening. So I, I agree with you that uh, the Middle East is, is quite the, the concern, no question about it. And, and I mean, the, the concern is that it has a high likelihood of spreading and it's a bigger likelihood it will spread when our response is weak rather than when our response is strong. And anyone who's ever studied the Middle East, been to the Middle East, operated in the Middle East, we all know that. But apparently we got a lot of politicians who still think they know better because they, you know, they read a New York Times article about the Middle East once. Uh, but it's just it's not true. Weakness is a provocation to particularly the radical elements in the Middle East. And and we just can't allow that to continue. But right now, that seems to be the path this administration is is trodden down. So to be fair and to be kind, would you say that this is just bad policy, uh, you know, and nothing more? Or is there something more? Uh, you know, I, I try not to get into the deep conspiracy stuff. Uh, I think it is clearly bad policy. And anybody who disagrees with that is kind of in la la land. But uh, is there more to it? Uh, look, there are some people that have been identified in this administration as having much tighter ties to Iran than any U.S. government official has any business having. Uh, and anyone with those kind of ties should not be allowed to hold positions of high responsibility that require clearances and things like that. There's been several of them, including, you know, President Biden's uh, envoy to to Iran, who now got fired because he was doing security violations. There are several others embedded in the system like that. I don't know if those people are actual agents of the other side or are they just people who have you know a really bad view of of the possibility of dealing with iran and what by bad i mean one that's completely detached from reality uh but you know we had a lot of that in the obama administration they really thought we needed to jettison the saudis completely not that the saudis are without sin they do some odd things too but uh, to think that they're going to turn Iran into a partner for the United States to, to bring peace and prosperity to the Middle East is nuts. Maybe someday they'll be that if you get rid of the administration they have right now. That regime in Tehran, I mean, they don't hide their feelings. I, I give them points for being honest about <laughs> what they really want and what they believe. We just have all these Americans who are saying, oh, that's not what they really mean. We we just need to negotiate with them. I said, come on, guys. When somebody like that says, no, we don't want to negotiate. We just want to kill you. You ought to take them at their word. 100%. Uh, because their, their actions are proving that's really all they want to do. And that's really no different than uh, the call for a two-state solution in Israel. You're looking to sit down at the table and form a two-state solution with people who's, who's – basic mantra is that Israel and every Jew should die. So how how is a two-state solution any kind of a potential solution? It, it just... But, yeah, when, when, they, when they openly admit, oh yeah, we'll sit down and talk to you about that. We'll, we'll let you give us aid. But you know what? That two-state thing, it really just needs to be one state and it's not a Jewish state. Right. It's them and all of those Jews need to die. They're not even saying just move the Jews out. They they say, no, you don't have to move them out. We want to kill them all. Come on. I mean, how can you negotiate with people like that? 
I, I agree. And, and, you know, more than that, when you look at the demonstrations in this country, and I've been in New York City where I've had to break through and get to the other side to get to a building, you look at the composition of the demonstrators, and what they don't seem to understand is that they would be probably very high on the hit list if, if Hamas, Hezbollah, you know, Islamic Jihad, whoever, if they were here, they'd be pretty high on the hit list. And no yeah. one's to get it. I, I mean, I, I've, I've viewed videos that we captured in Iraq, uh, you know, from the Saddam's regime of their taking homosexuals up to the third floor of buildings and tying their hands and feet and throwing them off the roof. And if they didn't break their neck on the way down, they just got beat up. They drag them back up and do it again. And they seem to have done it on a third story building. So they get at least a couple of shots before they finally killed them. I mean, who thinks like that? I mean, you don't have to like homosexuals, but that's not what we do. So a lot of these folks, the feminists who are, are cheering for, for the Palestinians, the, the uh, LGBT people that are cheering for them, they don't have a clue the right. price they would pay if they lived under one of those regimes. And, uh, and why it's don't they crazy. Have a clue? And the issue is that they don't and they never will have a clue because that's not how they get their information. They get it from whoever it is they get it from, TikTok, I guess. But that brings me to another issue that is very high on my uh, concern list, and that's our southern border. Uh, uh, I'm not exact. So, you know, between the fentanyl, uh, the crime, the potential terrorism, and uh, the, the health, potential health crisis in terms of unvetted, un what is, I'm trying to figure out what the potential, and I know Mayorkas is going to uh, that town where they used to come through, although they won't be coming through there today. What is the potential, what, what is in, in any sense of any logic, what is the end game? Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure the end game of this administration on other than they wanted to look as different from the Trump administration as they possibly could have. Uh, so anything President Trump thought was a good idea, they felt they had to go 100 percent in the opposite direction at 100 miles an hour. Uh, but to, I can't see how anyone, you know, Mayorkas used to work for ICE. You know, he wasn't some la la uh, politician. He was an officer right. in ICE. And my I have a son who works at the Department of Homeland Security. He's in the acquisition business, but he he said the the original thought about Mayorkas was positive. They said, okay, this guy came kind of from the ranks. He's probably going to be okay. And he has gone so far in the opposite direction of throwing his own people under the bus and that sort of thing that they're very disillusioned. Uh, you know, and you look at, yeah, you, I mean, I used to be in charge of the border for uh, under, in the Bush administration for DOD. I was responsible for an operation called Jumpstart that went from mid-2007 uh, um, mid to uh, mid-2008, where we had 3,000 and then 6,000 National Guardsmen on the border to help the Customs and Border Protection secure the border while they hired more people. Uh, the, the soldiers didn't get into law enforcement, even though as National Guard guys, they could have. But we chose not to use them that way. They did everything else, all the logistics, uh, intelligence gathering, all the support, everything to free up every one of the Customs and Border Patrol agents to work the border. And we did an amazing job. They got that way down. Uh, they, they turned it around, got CBP built up. And then, uh, you know, when this administration came in, they basically told them, well, we don't want you to enforce those laws. You know, this we're just you're now the travel agents getting the people from the border into the rest of the country. And and it's demoralized most of the Department of Homeland Security, but clearly CBP in, uh, specifically. 
Uh, and they're, these folks, interestingly, the majority of the CBP agents we have are Hispanic Americans. Right. Because one of the, the hiring requirements is you have to speak Spanish to work for them. Even if you're on the border up here where I live in northern Michigan with Canada, all those agents all speak Spanish because there's such a focus on the southwest. And as they rotate, they end up down there. Those folks have incredibly nuanced views of the border crisis. They they are totally against throwing things open. They're cops. They say if there's a law, we're supposed to enforce it. If you don't like the law, politicians change it and then we'll we'll enforce what you pass. But you don't just get to say, nah, just forget about those laws. And that's what we're doing. And it opens up all of the, the points that you mentioned a second ago, not just the masses of immigrants coming in but immigrants with health problems that have not had normal medical care forever. My family, both sets of grandparents came over here from Italy and mm -hmm. they, it took them a while to get in because if you had pink eye or something else, you got put on the boat and sent back and you could try again later, but you had to be healthy before you got here. We're not worried about that anymore. Apparently uh, we're not vetting them from a counterterrorism standpoint, we're not vetting them from a criminal standpoint. And even if we catch one that's a criminal and we deport them, they, they're coming back the next week. Right. And, and this time they'll probably get away with it because we have hundreds of thousands of people who are so-called getaways, people that don't get caught. And even though they know the ones that get caught, if they're legit, you know, they're just going to get passed on and told to come back for a hearing in right. some right. cases, 10 years from now. Right. And so the ones that get away who go through the trouble of, of avoiding that getting uh, apprehended processed and sent on, no, they're not going to get sent on. They know they got bad paper on them. And so we have hundreds of thousands of people we know have self-identified as I'm some kind of bad person that these guys are not going to let in if they catch me. So I'm going to go around the sneaky way. And we don't even know how many of them there are well, because they got away. Any country. And I always have this argument with people who don't seem to think there's an issue, uh, you know, without a border, you're not really a country. And what is the, again, you know, I go to the end game. If you're knowingly letting in tons and tons of the deadliest drug on the planet, if you're knowingly letting in a certain amount of criminals, a certain amount of potential terrorists, people who have uh, whatever, leprosy, measles, whatever, that's got to be some kind of a, knowingly doing that must be some kind of a crime uh, i don't know it, it it if it's not a crime it's really stupid policy well yeah i mean we, i mean we just went through a pandemic where the country was locked down it screwed up our economy screwed up our politics uh, messed up all sorts of businesses uh so now when we supposedly have this heightened concern for public health why would you let in a couple of million people of of at least dubious health standing, uh, you know, who aren't even being checked. It, it, I, I guess if they're, you know, spitting blood at the border, maybe they'll put them in a hospital. But for the most part, it doesn't matter. We just pass them on. And how is that doing your job as as government officials for protecting the 300 million of the rest of us? Well, you know, what? Uh, it's just crazy. I'll be in New York City tomorrow. And, you know, nobody cared here until migrants started coming here. <laughs> but it, it is it's infuriating. And I don't know what um, what the end result is going to be. You can't you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. And, you know, we've gotten to the point I call it almost um, learned uh, apathy where something happens for so long. You know, it's so egregious, but it just keeps happening and happening. And then people are like, it becomes normalized. And when bad things become normalized, you know, I always tell my oldest 
child who is more left leaning that elections have consequences. You know, I love that phrase because, you know, whether you're in New York City, Michigan, or the United States, elections have consequences. And people, you know, people don't seem to really grasp that. You know, I mean, it, it, it's incredible. It, it is. And people need, do need to look at this broadly. I know most folks, they'll pick one issue that that's the issue they focus on in a given election. And it could be a very localized issue. And I'm not saying that's not important, but you can't avoid looking at the bigger picture. Because while you may be okay with that one issue, but if, if the people you elect are not deciding properly or applying the law properly, you're going to pay some price in other areas that affect not just you, but perhaps your whole state, perhaps the, your region, or in some cases, the entire country. And so your votes do matter. I always tell people, I'd rather somebody vote differently than me rather than not vote because oh. that that level of apathy bothers me. I think that's, you know, it's just so wrong to sit there and go, well, I don't think my vote matters. So I'm just going to stay home. Well, if you do that, you make that decision. You're voting already. You're just voting to give it to whoever likes the things you don't like. So my father used to say that there are two just two ways to make a decision omission and commission so you know if you choose not to vote you're omitting your right to vote instead of committing to whoever it is that you think but um you know the trickle down you know there's trickle down economics but there's trickle down politics too you can have your local issue and you can vote for it you can focus on it you can you can win it but, you know, I can tell you living in New York, the trickle down from Albany is just off the charts and we're losing we're losing our tax base because of it. Yeah, it's uh, I grew up in New York in Dobbs Ferry nice. uh, in Westchester. Uh, I still have family living there. Uh, love the place. But I got to tell you, it's hard to recognize it when I go back because it's it's so different uh, and it's not that there's different people there. I mean, our, that town has always been filled with immigrant communities of various sorts, kind of the line moves on who exactly it is. But the the politicians in Albany, you know, and even if you don't live in New York City, New York City politics still pushes into the rest of the state. Uh, and you realize you have people with this idea of, oh yeah, we're gonna follow all this woke policies but you know what? We're not really in our neighborhood, though. You know, that, that really should stay somewhere else. Well, maybe. Yeah, come on. That, that's you, you can't have it both ways. Uh, and it's difficult when you see the damage that's done. Uh, I had somebody ask me today about the the homeless populations on, on big city streets in America that look like, a, you know, a scene from, you know, The Walking Dead where these people are so strung out on fentanyl and heroin uh, or a combination thereof that they, you know, they look like zombies in a darn movie, just shuffling along, defecating on a street. And, and we're not talking back alleys or in the bad neighborhoods. Right. We're talking right on the main thoroughfares in, you know, the business districts. Uh, it's, and then they wonder why people move away. Well, some people move away, but again, that's like the, you know, San Francisco, you look at the streets and that's alert, you know, they're learning to accept that that is the normal course of business that unless someone's coming to town and they clean it out, but you know, it, it's, it's incredible. People are, well, I, you know, I hate to say it. And again, I'm trying to be apolitical, but people are sheeple. They just do as they're told. They don't, they don't really come out and and think about what's right. Now, I had a list of 10 things. Uh, well, I think we got stuck on two of them. The last thing, and then I'll let you go because I know you're busy. Uh, the potential for the grid. You know, I know you're a cyber crime, cyber, uh, you know, the, the intrusions are just every day and seemingly more, more sophisticated. What do you think the chances are that our electric grid 
or our power grid or all of our systems uh, could be and might be taken down. Uh, to be honest with you, in the in the recent past, a, a bigger problem has been the the fragileness of those grids uh, having an accident. You know, mm -hmm. the, the most recent big blackouts we had in on the eastern half of the country were created because some squirrel got in a, you know, a transformer box, which happens all over America all the time. But in this case, it caused some cascading effects as the system tried to move the, the electricity around and it shut everything down. Uh, because our grid is somewhat diversified, not not because anybody had a good idea to do that. It's just the way it's developed. You know, we have big uh, municipal components. We have some that's owned by by companies. We have other little bitty companies. All of those are interconnected, but there you, it's there isn't a switch that turns any one of them. You know, that could turn everything off. Right. So I think it's not yet highly likely that someone is going to be able to turn off the whole thing. Uh, probably the biggest danger for that would be some sort of a uh, weather related EMP thing, something from the sun that could, you know, fry stuff with, with electromagnetic pulse or something you, from a bad actor. Yeah. You, you could do it in a, in a section of the country with a nuclear device right. that was set off at altitude that, that could shut something down. I don't think, Anybody has the capability yet to, you know, throw a switch or hit the, the enter button and turn, you know, put us back into the 1700s. I, I just don't think it's there yet. But the, the, the bad guys who use the, the network as more and more things are tied through the Internet, uh, other uh, industrial control system in, in plants and utilities over water, electricity, gas, all that kind of stuff, the, the easier it is to control those through the internet, big efficiencies, save lots of money, works much more effectively, but boy, it's just vulnerable as all get out right. to an attack through the internet. That puts us at more risk. And like your, your thought of people sort of being like the frog in the, in the water, slowly boiling, they get used to all the junk on the streets it's the same thing with regard to our digital lives, our lives. We we see that. We get used to it. Oh, they stole my card. Okay, I'll get a new card. The company will replace what was stolen. We we stay sloppy when that happens. And I think we, we're in that loop right now where the bad guys get better and better at exploiting the Internet and all these other digital con connectivity that we have and the good guys and the innocent people, we're not getting any better at protecting it. We still do the same stupid things, both as individuals and as institutions. And, you know, we talked about it a lot when I was in government. And then when I went to IBM, I mean, everybody was just on fire about that. We got to protect it. We got to have better uh, cyber personal hygiene all that stuff, which was all true. And in, from what I've seen, we're still just as crappy at it now as we were then. Uh, and that is concerning to me because, you know, we did a, a giant exercise uh, back when I was still in the government where uh, somebody used a, a bracket app for the Sweet 16 in college basketball. Right. At that, you know, went on, it was all over the country. Everybody was playing on it. And it was malware and it infected the, the internet. It got into the utility systems and it, it caused these rolling blackouts and, and power outages that caused, you know, a level for a couple of weeks of lack of power. You know, banks didn't work anymore. You couldn't get gas because the pumps are all electric, all that kind of stuff. And in two weeks, things went downhill fast because our whole supply chain is just in time, uh, just, you know, at the moment you need it, uh, all that stuff, you shut it down for even a week and people start to get feral and, and it gets ugly yeah. really fast. Right. So, you know, that is a possibility. It's harder to do than, 
they show in the movies, thank goodness, but it's not impossible. So we do need to take that seriously. That's not just a movie script. That is something that is a legitimate threat. And I think it's kind of receded uh, since, you know, the, the earlier 2000s and, and mid 2000s or, you know, 2010, 2015 era. Uh, it's just not getting the attention it was getting before. So that is a uh, something to be concerned about and something when you talk to your legislators, citizens, you need to tell them, hey, we're concerned about this. What are you doing about that, Congressman? What are you doing about that, Senator? And and see what they have to say. Some of them are involved and know what they're talking about. Others don't have a clue. They're, they're still, well, what is a good password? You know, they're doing the same junk we're doing. And that's just not satisfactory. Well, this has been... Uh an honest discussion, not exactly uh, 100% uplifting, but I know that we uh, we didn't cover some of the large geopolitical subjects that I had, and I'm hoping that uh, sometime in the future you would consider coming back to finish my list. I would be happy to. It'd be a pleasure. I've enjoyed the conversation. You're, you're asking serious questions about serious issues, Mike, so I, that's, that's something that's important because your listeners need to hear that. You know, whether Bucci's answers are the best that they can judge, but you're asking the right questions, brother. So keep it up. Thank you. And thank you for coming on. It's my pleasure. Take care. You too. Welcome to Do You Ever Wonder, the show that brings you answers. All right. We, uh, we kind of missed up on the, on the outro, but that's okay. So I'm just going to say thank you for coming. And I look forward to seeing you and let's just hope everything goes well. Sounds good. All right. Take care. All right. Take care. And just let me know when you'd like to have me back. I'll find a time to do it. Fantastic. Thank you.